Thursday, Thursday, everybody, talking baseball across the country today. The Division I tournament kicking off this weekend as teams host regionals across the nation. Three Big 12 teams in the top eight national seeds, and Oklahoma State going to five seed Arizona this weekend. Now joining the show with us, voice of TCU baseball, Jeff Williams. Jeff, here you are again in Fort Worth for regional. This is uh, nothing new. No, and you know this is the the way you have to roll if you if you pay a lot of attention to college baseball. The road to Omaha is greatly the skids are greased if you can play not only regional but certainly super regional at home. And TCU is always their fan base has always shown out, which is why they went. 2014, 2015, 2016, 2017. They weren't always the hosts there, but the times they were, they're there. You know, Jeff, you, you talk about it, and we mentioned it off air a little bit. I, I'm looking at different regionals. I mean, teams that are going to Tucson may have a remotely tough time, but I'm looking at Knoxville, where the fan bases are, are not quite what the rest of the SEC may offer, and they haven't hosted a lot of regionals. Or even looking at South Bend, I mean, those don't scare you going into a regional. But Fort Worth, on the other hand, that's a tough place to play. How well does Fort Worth play into TCU going into the weekend? Well, it's, you know, it's a compact ballpark with respect to how it's configured for the, the stands. It'll hold, you know, five, six, seven thousand, but they're all right there. Not even really much past the first and third base lines. They also have the berms and all that, but it, they are right on you and they are into the woo birds. If anything goes wrong, the woo birds are going to be out and they will just drive up the energy level. Jeff, you're talking about the the ballpark and how well it plays. Just fans. I mean, I, I've been a couple of times now to Fort Worth, and the way you sack that thing up is is remarkable. One of the best, if not the best, facilities in the Big 12 and atmospheres in the country. What is going to play to TCU's advantage field-wise? I mean, is this a hitter's ballpark? We're talking more pitching. I mean, where does TCU have an advantage when it comes to the actual complex itself? It's going to be interesting to see because of the weather forecast coming up this weekend. It can play big. And if it does, then that is when the winds, I looked at it for Friday and Saturday, winds are playing out of the southeast, which is straight in from center field. Now, we've had an unusual spring, obviously, and a lot of north winds, so the park has played a lot smaller. But you've got teams here, uh, McNeese, DBU, TCU, that'll bang it around. But – from that standpoint, TCU is kind of the in the middle there. They can power it up, but they can also, you know, play the singles game, take advantage of mistakes you made. Whereas teams like DBU and McNeese tend to kind of rely on the home run more than the other teams. Oregon State's not really a big banging club at all, uh, but TCU can kind of do it all. And so, if the winds are blowing in and the park's playing a little bit smaller, that's an advantage for the Frogs, I think. Jeff, I want to go back a little bit here. A couple weeks ago for TCU baseball, I'll, I'll say a couple weeks. Let's go about a month or so ago to Baylor mm -hmm. TCU and that series in Fort Worth where Baylor is is trying to set themselves up with uh, in Big 12 play with at least a win or two on the first weekend, and then TCU after that first after this from some struggles in the first game really blows through Baylor. How key was it for the Horn Frogs to start their conference slate so hot? I think it was remarkably important, and that's really because TCU, you know, just anytime you're starting off the league against a team that's picked up near the top, but a club like Baylor this year, argument could be made. They're the best hitting club in the Big 12, and I don't even know if there's an argument there. They were – they had one of the best batting averages. They bang it around, but TCU's pitching at that time just really kind of shut them down, and I, I, it probably caught – Baylor may have been a little bit shocked by it, and, and there was some – it reverberated through the weekend because they were you. They came in, I think, in that game. I remember looking; they were batting 325, which in a Power Five conference, that's a remarkable team batting average. And TCU just basically shut that down. Jeff, I love how you said that Baylor was shocked a little bit. And uh, I will say, after playing series against Memphis, Xavier, UTSA, and Prairie View A and M, uh, yeah, shock. That, that's a yeah. little bit different when you go to Fort Worth and have to play TCU on the road. I think shock's a good word. Uh, but but even looking past that, and what TCU was able to do with a sweep of Oklahoma, a sweep of Oklahoma State, and to that point, a lot of folks thought OU was a tournament team. Oklahoma State was a possible host team. I mean, you couldn't ask for a much better start in conference aside from a loss at Texas Tech, which everybody does. Oh, yeah, because from late March, really starting kind of with that Baylor series, maybe 
uh, a little bit of the late non-conference. He went 22 and three, mm. you know, or, you know, for, from late May into early or late March into early May, they were just rolling on it. Just like I said, you lose three games out of 25 in college baseball. I mean, I don't care who you are, but if, when you're playing power five clubs, that's just a remarkable achievement, especially against the number two RPI conference in the country. And, you know, they've had their stumbles along the way. I guess after that, they lost two of three, the last two of the uh, two of three in their last three series. But at that time they were just, they could do no wrong. You know, if they needed what they call Lupton magic, that's something we haven't talked about yet. Uh, it's often referred to, I and mean, you can walk a guy with two outs in the ninth up seven and you walk a guy, they think they're going to turn that into seven runs or eight runs. And it's happened before, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well, Jeff, like you said, I mean, uh, that kind of the series there right after coming off the sweep at West Virginia, you go mm -hmm. Texas at home. And then the nation's eyes, anybody that follows college baseball is watching Fort Worth for UT and TCU. Texas takes the tight Friday night game. You win it 2-1 on Saturday. And then a blowout Sunday losing at home that kind of spirals you into losing two out of three at home against ULM and then dropping a series to Kansas State. What happened there in that span of three weeks for TCU? You know, I, I, I don't really know. I mean, at that time, and this has been a, a – pitching has been the thing that Schlossnagel, Coach Schlossnagel has really had to focus on this year. Early in the year, he had starters, but the bullpen couldn't get anybody other than Halen Green, River Ridings. They have a couple of dominant guys, Chuck King, that come out. But they needed some other guys early on in the year to step up out of the bullpen. The starting pitching – kind of rolling along. But then the bullpen kind of got it together, but the starters kind of faltered. Now that's all kind of come together. They're actually probably at this point from a pitching standpoint, their bullpen is capable as they did in the championship game against Oklahoma State last week. They can kind of carry a game. That was kind of a Johnny Allstaff type game and they were able to get through it without us, you know, because your pitching gets taxed in these situations, especially regionals and in uh, if you go to Omaha, the same way. The Supers, it's more of a normal weekend series. But it's been a, kind of a weird thing. But they're they're hitting kind of against Texas, and the, you know their pitching is unbelievable. The pitching was, or the hitting was a problem there uh, with regard to losing those games. But um, it's been an interesting pitching year. But right now, I think for, they've got more arms now. But they right now don't necessarily have as many guys that can go as long as they did early in the year with their starting their Friday, Saturday, Sunday guys. Jeff, in looking at what TCU did against Kansas State to end the season, they played the, the Wildcats six times in 10 days, pulling out some MLB stuff there. Um, and they, they struggled at times against the Wildcats, even going to Big 12 tournament play, but turned it around to beat Texas Tech pretty mm -hmm. soundly. So beating Kansas State by way of mercy rule with 17 runs on the board in Bricktown, winning the Big 12 championship, coming off of a slow start, or a slow finish, I should say, in regular season play, how crucial was it for TCU to win the Big 12 tournament? Um, I think getting to the Big 12 championship was the ultimate goal. I think if you're talking about trying to set yourself for proceeding, but if you're in the championship game, hey, let's go ahead and win this thing. But their confidence, which may have waned a little bit in those last three weekends, I think that's kind of what you're talking about. The confidence level may not have quite been there. To, to fight through what they fought through, again, they really only had two, maybe three established starters available for the whole tournament and they were able to fight through it. So now I think in, in the Big 12 tournament set up just like Omaha, right? And, and you've got teams that – a number of teams in that that are Omaha-type talent. Got to think that, that they're just flying high from a, a confidence standpoint because they kind of did a College World Series light sort of – they were able to get through – even through the losers bracket, because they did lose that one game to Kansas State, and they were still able to come out on the other end uh, shining purple. Jeff, uh, I find it interesting you said it plays like Omaha. The only difference is that Bricktown, the ball gets up and gets out. I'm sure, yes, you, I'm sure you've been to Omaha and seen that it is tough to hit when you go to TD Ameritrade, whereas Bricktown, and you can see it in TCU's numbers, just putting up run production unbelievably well over the course of, of their week in Oklahoma City. And now moving forward into this tournament, you talk about the, the, the Lupton magic. 
And I, uh, mm-hmm. I really wanted to talk about the, the Bricktown magic with the 7-6 win over Kansas State in Game 1 where it looked like the Wildcats had TCU on the ropes, especially early. Um, moving from Bricktown magic and Lupton magic combined, I mean, how well are those two playing for TCU late in the season where you got to win these games? Well, it's it's just there's something, and I can't put my finger on it, but there's just something that, that – Coach Schlossnagel, he gets those kids on there, and then the players that are there, and as they progress through the program and they pass it along, he is able to just – they never think they're going to lose. They just never think that. They never think it's too far out. You know, you go back several years ago in the – I think it was the Supers, I believe, at Lupton. They scored – they were down big – and scored seven runs, you know, in the in the final inning to come back and win. And and it's it's a pressure. And this year they're more of a, a kind of a running team and what they call speed pressure. And they and they they've added that more to their arsenal. Not they hadn't been able to steal before, but boy, they have turned it. They've cranked it up a notch this year. So you know they'll get the walk and they think, all right, that guy's going to score because in a lot of cases this year. It's a double. You walk a guy and it turns into a double, essentially, you know, effectively. But it just, they never, whatever Coach Schlossnagel instills in those kids and they pass along to the next generation, they just always believe they're going to win. I quite frankly don't think it matters where the venue is. Well, Jeff, as we move into the regional at TCU and look a little bit closer at some of these teams coming to town, you know, I look at Starkville. Mississippi State is seventh in the nation. TCU mm-hmm. six. You would think the road to be easier for number six. Mississippi State yeah. has Samford, VCU, and Campbell. None of those are in the top 50 RPI. And granted, VCU's won 21 straight, but it's VCU. TCU right. has McNeese State, who won the Southland. Oregon State, who won a national championship a couple of years back. DBU, who perennially has a really good baseball club. This Fort Worth, uh, Fort Worth Regional is nothing to sneeze at. No, you know, they talk about the the most difficult ones, and nobody talks about Fort Worth. And maybe they're that – I think I've seen three regionals where they – especially Arizona. That, that's a seriously ridiculous field out there. That's anybody's game, including the four-seed Grand Canyon, because they're close to home, and that's a legit program. But TCU is probably maybe that fourth regional where – Watch out, because this is a DBU team that has played in Fort Worth. I think this will be their fourth time since 2014. They're right down the road. It's 30 minutes away. And Dan Hefner just has a team that will just crush the baseball. Now, again, they may get taken a little out of their game, uh, but they also are a lot about speed. They've, they're 80 out of 100 stolen bases this year. They have 90 home runs, 106 doubles. So those home runs they've been hitting might turn into doubles. But they, uh, you know, their ballpark probably plays a little easier than what TCU's will this weekend. But DBU's scary McNeese, uh, the job that Justin Hill has done there, before he got there, they, they barely had winning records. And now they've either won a tournament or a league championship, I think, what, three of the last five years. They're a club that is – the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. They've got solid pitching. They've got a, a star at the plate in Clayton Raspberry's batting 360, uh, 12 oh, double-digit home runs. I think it's 12, 15, 20 doubles. But he's he, – he, and you'll notice him if you watch this regional this weekend. He's got the big, giant, full red beard. He can join the cast of Duck Dynasty as soon as baseball season is over this year. He's a lot of fun to watch, but he can power the ball out there. And this is a team that's kind of on a roll. In late April, they lost seven in a row. Uh, then they lost five of six in early May. But they won seven of their last nine, went 4-0 and in the Southland Conference Championship Tournament, and 35-5 to was the margin of victory. Now, they won the championship 2-1, to so that tells you what they did in the first three prior to that. But that's your four seed, and that's who TCU is going to face. And when you want to throw in another little kind of a, a scary point for TCU, they've struggled some this year against – soft toss lefties now the guy they'll face more than likely will Dion, legit ace he could play he's probably got power five talent he's not soft toss but he's 88 to 92 but he's a guy that has a little bit of a hitchiness to his motion so it's it's it comes at you and it's hard to get a rhythm with him i've even heard people say it's kind of a hitchiness like uh, clayton kershaw you know he has that weird little thing he does kind of throws you off a little bit. I'm not saying he's Clayton Kershaw, but he kind of has that same sort of motion, but he's thrown 92 innings. I think he's got five complete games. He can go the distance on you. So 
left-handers, TCU has a lot of great left-handed, but they've got more really good lefties than righties at the plate. And so that they were going to, they're probably going to have to face Will Dion. And again, he's a legit ace. Jeff, moving into this regional from a health standpoint, I know there are a lot of teams across the country. I mean, Arkansas is one of those. It's a powerhouse, the mm-hmm. one overall seed. They're dealing with two or three guys that would be in that lineup and play in a crucial situation. For TCU, from a health standpoint, I know even going into the last series against Kansas State in the regular season, there were some guys they had just gotten back for that one. Uh, mm-hmm. for, for the team now, health standpoint, where is TCU? I think they're in pretty good shape. I haven't heard yet on Gene Wood's availability. He'd been their regular starter at first base, and he had a couple of things tweaked here and there. And I'm trying to recall, I don't know that we saw him in Oklahoma City. If it was, it was limited. However, they've got some guys that can fill that spot. They've got uh, Shepard who can play at first base, and then uh, they've also got uh, whenever they face a lefty. And so, it may, as it turns out, they may see him anyway, uh, but Austin Henry can also play at first base as well. And so he bats from the right side, and that's kind of the platoon they had sort of set up. So any left-handers that that they see, it might be him as well. But I think everybody else, much better shape than they were. How about, uh, Jeff, going into this as well, when you look across the field for TCU, Oregon State, what they bring, McNeese, DBU, if there's one team that scares you the most, who would it be? Probably DBU. Um, Oregon State is a, a – they're the two seed. They finished fifth in the league. But this is a team they're limping in. They lost – now their opponents were tough. Arizona State, Arizona Stanford. They dropped eight of their last 11. But it also mixed in there a midweek loss to Portland. So they're coming in and, they, and all of this slumping for them started when they lost their best bat, Jacob Melton. Uh, outfielder for the he's the middle game of the Irvine series, shoulder injury, surgery. This guy was their leadoff hitter. He was batting over 400 and ops over 1,100, and a huge loss in their lineup. They're 8-11 since he left. And when you look at how they've fared, really, and again, their RPI, I think, is 22. Uh, you may have that in front of you, but I think they're very highly rated. But if you look, they were 4-11 against the top 25, 4-5 against the top or 26 to 50. So they're eight and 16 against the top 50. They made their record, which is 34 and 22 against 51 and above Mm. 26 at six. They really crushed it there. Well, they're not going to see those teams here this weekend. So I'm just, I'm not quite sure what, what to expect from them. They are obviously a perennial power uh, second year head coach though there so they may still be trying to build it up pat casey was unbelievable there uh especially in the middle aughts and then a few years ago won another national championship but i'm, I'm gonna have to see it i think from them uh they'll probably go with kevin abel early on he's very good pitcher but he's a guy that if you that's their friday night guy he's he's had a, a nice year 342 era opponents batting barely over 150 but here's the thing he didn't last very long if you can, and if they end up, if he ends up not pitching early and they save him, you know, hey, maybe we can play TCU. Uh, he's a guy, he's, no one runs up a pitch count like the TCU offense does. But he's a guy, he had 15 wild pitches, hit 17 batters this year, um, walks a lot of guy, guys, strikes out a lot of guys. And so those kind of guys just generally tend not to last too deep. He's had a few go deep, but well, there have been games where he's been three innings, four innings, five innings, you know, and then so you're going to put a lot of pressure on your bullpen. And in a, a tournament like this, you get toward the end of it, that's tough, you know, if you're really taxing your bullpen like that. Well, Jeff, before we get you out of here, I want to thank you for coming on today and giving us perspective on TCU going to this regional. And I know we got a uh, – Skin in the game, not so much for Baylor when it comes to making this postseason, but TCU, Texas Tech, and Texas. We're doing a wraparound and a lot of coverage today on those three teams, national seeds going into the tournament. Do want to uh, say outside of baseball, Jami Asbury, the star for Oklahoma State women's basketball, has officially announced she's transferring to Baylor. So a huge pickup for Nikki Collin, one of the best players in the Big 12. Asbury and Mack last season were unstoppable for Oklahoma State. She'll be in a Baylor uniform next year. Uh, Jeff, thanks again for coming on. Before we let you get out of here, got a Bear Games question of the day for you. If you could go back, yeah, this is all guests and callers get the Bear Games question of the day every day. (laughs) If you could go back and allow your favorite team to replay one game in any any sport in their history, what would it be? Uh, The catch. Dallas Cowboys. Wow. 
God, I was looking for like a TCU Baylor, maybe a. Oh, like, okay. Well, if you want to go to college. Yeah, um, well, yeah, but the catch the catch makes sense, and no one said that yet. But sure. let's go to your TCU game. So you got your your pro game. Give me your college game. It'd probably be the game against Baylor um, down in Waco, and I was on the sidelines when I was doing sideline for radio, and and Griffin just he was, he was just closing his eyes and throwing it mm. i swear and he had guys that were catching it, it was in 49 48 48 47 i can't remember the score but it was probably a decade you know robert griffin the third um boy he, that game just just tore it up for i think me. that was 11 i'm pretty sure that was 2011 that was one of his yeah. that was like one of the last years in floyd casey when baylor uh when yes. rg3 just that was his a game that he exploded that was one of the first games of the year too that was odd how early those two teams played if i remember correctly i thought you'd say 61 58 the score that baylor fans will never forget uh mclean <laughs> stadium but uh jeff i, yeah. I want to thank you again for coming on today it was a pleasure to talk to you and get your perspective going into the weekend all right, appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks again. Jeff uh, Jeff Williams joining us, the voice of TCU baseball, talking about them going to the regional this weekend. I uh, do want to say 